Okay, so I think I'll start with the introduction. Uh, so we are, this is the first day of a, of a week visit by uh, um, Charles Cockle, Dr. Charles Cockle from the University of Edinburgh. Um, and uh, I've known Charles now for seven, eight years, yeah. something like that, um, because he was a member of our Expedition 364 in the Hill of Chicks of Impact. Um, as our one of our two astrobiologists that, that, that sailed on the expedition, which is fantastic. Um, and Charles originally I said, went to Bristol was your undergrad, I'm yes. trying to remember this all. <laughs> Oxford was your PhD, yes. yeah. postdoc at NASA Ames, yeah. then you went to the British and Aerobic Survey, okay, Open University, okay. and yeah. then yeah. University of Sorry. About five years each place, okay. 11 at the last, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and Charles works on astrobiology and, and, and exotic life um, on Earth and in extreme environments, whether that's caves or in Arctic ice, or and now he's working on brines that can be in Europa, all yeah. kinds of exciting things. So, okay. um, and uh, I guess without further ado, he's going to talk today about the subsurface habitability of Mars to the to our center. Um, he also, by the way, runs a UK center for astrobiology, a bit like us when you see virtual. That was less, a little less virtual centers um, yeah, so, um, out of the physics department as a astrobiologist. Um, and uh, anyway, so he's going to give us our talk today on Mars. We have um, various meals planned. So talk to Connie or I if you're interested in a lunch or a dinner throughout the, the course of the week. And then he's rounding out the week. So he'll be on main campus for the next two days. Uh, and then Thursday and Friday, he's going to be up at the research campus and he'll be giving the Friday UTIG seminar. Which is um, available also via Zoom on uh, the uh, astrobiology of impact. Yeah, right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Charlie. Right. Thank oh. you very much, Sean. Thanks, uh, Sean and Connie, for inviting me. Um, beautiful place you live in. I drove from uh, Pasadena down here, and I had not uh, appreciate how vast <laughs> Texas was. <laughs> I that as a geographical fact. I hadn't experienced it viscerally. You know, it was just <laughs> it was fantastic. I do the same. And I thought today I would talk about, um, well, another vast sort of uh, plane here, uh, planet Mars, and discuss subsurface habitability. And because it's a center for habitability, uh, what I thought I'd do is discuss some uh, work that we've done in our lab over a number of years uh, to do with habitability and try and bring in some geology and biology that may be of interest in the center, which I gather is a fairly interdisciplinary um, center. It's also great to see Craig. Craig and I go back to my postdoc. Um, trying to not think of how far. <laughs> yeah, 1997, I think. I, Jesus. We had all sorts of interesting discussions about ultraviolet radiation on the early Earth and Mars, and uh, yeah. wrote a proposal, I think. Yeah. John Stallow and I were trying to yeah. get an extra right. biology center. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, of your time. That, that was a long while ago. So it's great to, great to see you. Um, before I Get into the science. I, I thought I would spend just a couple of minutes, not too long, just explaining where I hail from. Partly because this is a center for habitability here. So I thought that it might be interesting to just, just to say briefly what we do. And maybe there are some opportunities for connections of various kinds. So we, I set this up in Edinburgh 11 years ago when I arrived, the UK Center of Astrobiology. We were UK because we were uh, the UK node of the NASA Astrobiology Institute when they had international affiliates. And we're interested in a range of things from um, the emergence of life on worlds, life in extreme environments, uh, fossil life on planetary bodies, and using a variety of methods, including missions, to try and understand that. And I can talk about this another time, but we'll talk about it much more. The thing I did want to advertise is that we are starting a master's in astrobiology and planetary sciences this September. So if you know of any students who want to spend a year in Edinburgh, it's a beautiful city. It could do with being about two or three degrees warmer. Uh, another year, it's a beautiful city. And uh, we're taking students, um, well, this year's a bit late, but next year and years onwards, um, this will be up and running. So that there's, and you can get more information there. Um, we, as I say, have published a number of papers and work uh, on the study of extraterrestrial life. We tend to be interested in the what one might describe as the abiotic baseline of astrobiology. There's a lot of enthusiasm for finding life elsewhere, but how do you actually distinguish that from the background noise and the sorts of chemical signatures of life that are not biology? I think it's sort of a very fundamental part of looking for life anywhere. So we've tended to focus on that, although we look at life in all sorts of environments, which, we'll, which I'll explain in this um, seminar. And then we also have an interest in using microbiology to plan for the human establishment of permanent human presence beyond the earth so we've flown experiments 
to the International Space Station. This is the work I did a couple of years ago, showing how we can use microbes to mine uh, rare earth elements and platinum group elements from asteroids, uh, using biology as a catalyst to do this. So this is all about space, human space exploration and sustainability. I'm actually not going to talk about that today. I'm happy to talk about it another time, but just to illustrate some of our sort of applied interests in so it's habitability and astrobiology. So let's get on to this um, seminar. We're going to talk about the subsurface habitability of Mars. Uh, and the reason for that is because we know that today the surface of Mars is uh, not very suitable for life, partly because the surface is almost bang on the triple point. So there's no possibility of sustained uh, liquid water on the surface of the planet, although people argue about thin films of water that may be possible for very brief times. But in general, uh, this is an environment that's not suitable for biology. Although in the past, of course, this was very different to several meters across. And it's an image taken by Curiosity. And you can see these uh, beautiful sedimentary layers, which are proposed to be remnants of um, ancient uh, lake on Mars and Gale Crater, and now also shown in Jezero Crater by uh, Perseverance. So clearly, in the Noachic, about three and a half billion years or before, there was sustained liquid water on the surface of the planet, but not today. Uh, but the subsurface is interesting because this is an environment that may have uh, sustained habitable conditions in the past and may even do today. And I guess that's the hypothesis to be tested. Does, does the subsurface of Mars harbor um, conditions suitable for habit habitability? And this is the NASA concept for how long we test that, which is to drill. I'm not going to talk much about the technicalities of that. Uh, we all know how difficult it is to drill on the Earth. So uh, this is optimistic, and probably this is optimistic. Well, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that, this just illustrates the general concept that subsurface is of interest. And what I want to do in the seminar is just to talk about what that environment might be like based on what we know um, about the, the earth and the microbiology. I'm a microbiologist, by the way, microbiology of the subsurface. And I'm going to give away the punchline of this talk, which is to try and convince you that although Mars looks strangely familiar in many ways, volcanic rocks, salts, and liquid water. It's actually a very alien world, and the subsurface may be very different to the sort of environments and microbiology that we know about on the Earth. And we have some empirical knowledge to, to back up the idea this is, a, this is a different environment. So it's very fashionable at the moment in the astrobiology community to talk about analog environments. You'll hear people talk about analogs and going to environments on the Earth that may be similar to Mars. I want to show you that although that's useful, um, in fact, Mars is a very different environment. Let me just begin, because I think it's useful, with some sort of definition of habitability. This might be patronizing to a bunch of people who are part of the center for habitability. I'm sure you've thought about this before. But I think it's useful uh, just to discuss what we mean. Um, we might define habitability as, as or a habitable environment as an environment that can support at least one known organism over some defined period of time. And at least one known organism, of course, most ecosystems have more than one organism, but from a minimal definitional point of view, habitability must be a set of reference to at least one organism that we know about. So you can have all sorts of interesting discussions that people do in the literature about, well, what would happen if life used silicon or liquid ammonia as a solvent? And all those conversations are fun, but they're not empirically constrained by any known biology. So, you know, they're good conversations to have, but ultimately, when we assess the habitability of anybody, it's based on our knowledge of the structure of living things. It's a simple scientific um, statement. Now, you can assess habitability in an instant in time. And for us who are biologists, we look for things that can sustain uh, reproduction, making this growth and reproduction itself. Uh, and this is the sort of canonical list that you'll find in many astrobiology, Chinox elements, but also some transition metals. Uh, cations and anions, monovalent cations like um, potassium, sodium, some anions like chloride ions in certain cases, a uh, solvent to carry out biochemistry, uh, an energy supply that could be light, as in phototrophy, or a redox couple, as in chemical energy, and then some sort of suitable physical and chemical conditions. And by that, I mean um, ions that are not toxic and a, and a temperature range in which biology can occur. I'm not going to discuss this anymore. Sort of textbook stuff, it's not very interesting. But I think what is interesting to point out is that these things are primarily questions for biologists about when these conditions are met. And that's what we do as part of going to field sites and we look for where these conditions are met and the sorts of organisms that can take advantage of whatever is in that environment. But what's of interest to planetary scientists is these things sustained 
over geological time scales. So if I take a lump of basalt and I dump it in some water with some carbon dioxide and some fixed nitrogen, these things are met pretty easily. So instantaneous habitability may actually be very common throughout the universe. What's more interesting is how can these things be sustained over a billion year time scales, geological time scales, to allow for the emergence of, a, of an observable biosphere, which is what we're interested in when we're looking at exoplanets or Mars. And that strays into geophysics, because generally we're talking about geoche geochemical turnover to make these things available. So things like plate tectonics, impact events, volcanism, uh, suitable temperature range for geological time scales might involve carbon circuit cycle, similar mechanisms. These things are, are geophysical mechanisms. So if you want to understand whether the biology is sustained over geological time scales, you sort of need the geophysicists to tell you about how, what are the mechanisms that might allow this. So I simply point this out. One is a definition, simply also to point out some background ideas about habitability, which is so what the central thing you see what I want to talk about um, now. So let's think about the subset of habitability of Mars. If you look at a map of Mars and you plot uh, every impact crater, well-defined crater on the planet, you end up with this sort of uh, diagram. And it's interesting uh, because this is a, a database of craters, and that database contains over 350,000 craters on the surface of Mars. And when you compare that to the Earth, where there are, well, when I say about 197, that's not very useful, but it's something around 200 now, it sort of grows a few each year. Uh, the difference between those numbers is, of course, nothing to do with the impact plants. It's just on Earth, the craters have been subducted, destroyed in plate tectonics, and eroded by our uh, vigorous hydrologic and aeolian regime that tends to destroy craters. But on Mars, uh, no plate tectonics, at least not, uh, it may have not started very early on, but it certainly shut down early. And a lot of those craters, going right back to uh, early Martian history, into the Noachian, are now preserved. And the question you might ask yourself is, how would those craters affect the deep subsurface biosphere? Because on the face of it, when you think about the effect of an asteroid impact or a comet impact, it should fracture the deep subsurface and change the conditions for habitability. So although these things are very rare on the Earth, and it's actually quite difficult to get funding to go and look at the ecology of craters, because people look at it and go, what is this highly esoteric study of biology? I know that from experience. On Mars, these are highly pervasive. And so here again is the first disanalogy that I want to raise is that the subsurface of Mars has been heavily altered by impact events compared to the Earth, where these things are relatively rare in terms of their effects on biology. But if we wanted to understand the effects of all of these craters on deep subsurface biology, the thing you might do is go to a terrestrial impact crater and ask yourself, what effect does all this energy being plowed into the subsurface have on um, biology? And my first uh, work on this was up in the Horton impact crater uh, when I was uh, doing my postdoc at NASA 8. And this is an impact crater up in the Canadian High Arctic, Devon Island, about 24 kilometers across. You can see this on a, um, an image from space. As you fly into that crater, you'll see it's full of these wretched hills. And you may not be able to see this very clearly. It looks a little bit like concrete, essentially crushed up rock that is formed by the intense energy of the impactor hitting the ground smashing up the target rock that is partly uh, partly liquefied and heated then it sets some of this material thrown out of the crater some of it settles back into the crater and forms these gray breccia hills this is actually one of the best preserved breccia lenses in any terrestrial crater on earth if you wander around on these breccia hills you will find lumps of gneiss which if you break them open contain these cryptoendolithic communities and these are photosynthetic communities that live just beneath the surface they live inside the rock where they are protected from the Arctic extremes on the surface. They can't go too deep because otherwise they don't get enough light. So they form these very characteristic bands. And on the face of it, uh, these are not unusual because you can find them in the, in the Antarctic in sedimentary rocks. But they're extremely unusual in this context because this material is usually um, extremely, uh, has extremely low porosity and low transmission of visible light. Okay. There's no other place in the world where people have reported crypto communities in NICE. So why are they growing in the impact crater? Well, when you hit these rocks with uh, a lot of energy, when the, when the uh, impact hits the target rock, they're heated to uh, very high temperatures, pressurized to several tens of gigapascals, and that partly melts and fractures the rock. What you end up with is this pumice-like texture. This is a one-centimeter scale bar. 
And this is an SVM image, and you can see it's a 100 micron scale bar, not very clear. But you can see this, this fasciculated pumice like texture where the rock has been heated and, um, and fractured. And what has happened here is that the rock uh, porosity to pore space of suitable for microbes has increased by about 25 times, and the transmission of light has increased by an order of magnitude. So here you've got an example of a way in which impact has improved the conditions for life and allowed life to penetrate inside the rock and grow, grow uh, inside this material. So this is actually a, an unusual example of how impacts can improve the conditions for life. Most people think of impacts as dinosaur killing events, which they are. But once the area is cooled down, the geophysical changes to the rock can improve conditions for life. So that's a surface example, okay? These are photosynthetic, they need light. So this is what happens. These were some of the first observations on the surface of an impact crater. Uh, with respect to this seminar, we might ask what happens in the deep subsurface? So this is um, uh, an IODP, ICDP expedition. I was involved with a short occasion um, that, that he and Joe Morgan and others were leading to drill into the peak ring of the Chesapeake, uh, the Chicxulub, when it comes to Chesapeake, the Chicxulub uh, <laughs> impact crater. Um, the uh, crater associated with the Ain Cretaceous extinction. So this is what most people know it for. And we were able to drill um, about 1.3 kilometers into the crater and retrieve a core and look at the microbiology of the, uh, the deep subsurface in an impact structure. So this can get very complex. In the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on some key points here. Here is the core. And the pink bar here is the basement rock that is sort of rebounded. You imagine this thing hitting the earth, you can think of it as like a drop of water hitting a bowl of water and you get that rebounded liquid in the middle. So the, the rocks are rebounded. This is basement granite. The black bars are sort of intercalated impact melt and pre impact material. The sway bite here, this blue bar, is material that has resurged back into the crater. Think of it as sort of giant tsunamis, lots of that crushed rock, a bit like Horton, that's washed back into the crater and it's filled up. And this might have been laid down on the orders of tens of minutes. So this is really a catastrophic event. And then this brown is the post impact material. You can see the sway bite, that sort of crushed up rock, a bit like the Horton sway bite. And all I want to do is focus your, your minds on uh, this part in the sway bite. This is the impact fractured material. It's full of fractures from all the rock that's been crushed up and, and hit by the, uh, the impact and the pressure wave that's gone through and then depressurized and caused uh, sufficient energy for impact fracturing. And what you'll notice is porosity increases in the sway bite, and so does the number of microbes still count through the core. The microbial numbers are increased by. A uh, couple of orders of magnitude, and the amount of DNA that we get from the core is also increased. So you can now see um, some similarity with the Horton story. Here we have rocks that are heavily fractured, and the hypothesis for why there's an increase here is that these heavily fractured, high porosity rocks improve energy and nutrient flow, or redox couple and nutrient flow through the rocks and provide an enhanced habitat uh, for life. Also, see um, increased microbial numbers at some of these interfaces. The reason why microbes tend to like interfaces is because at interfaces you get um, chemical disequilibrium. So microbes love geological interfaces. You can get uh, fluid flow and chemical disequilibrium. Some of these interfaces are associated with impact, impact melt that's been injected into the rocks. Yeah, so these sorts of things associated with these uh, geochemical disequilibrium. So we also find that the microbes associated with these different um, materials are different. This is the most useless part of my talk, but it's all the different microbes. So I know there are, mic there are microbiologists here, just to show you who did work, and here are these different microbes. But what we can do is just get to the, the, the punchline of what's in here. If you look at this Venn diagram, which is, you can think of these as uh, approximations to species, and you can look at the organisms inhabiting the post-impact sway bite and the basement and you'll see there's some overlap there in the numbers of species, but there are also distinctive communities living in each of these um, uh, lithological horizons. So what's interesting about this is that the impact uh, continues to shape the deep biosphere to the present day. It's sort of not very surprising if you think about it, because this impact that comes in, it messes up all the rocks, that the changing distribution of the rocks will then change the chemistry of the ions leaching from those rocks. And because chemistry influences microbiology, the microbial communities will be different. So from a scientific point of view, I suppose this isn't very surprising, but it is sort of remarkable to think that 66 million years after this catastrophic event, the deep biosphere 
is still shaped by that catastrophe that uh, these events uh, alter microbiology in, in deep time. And if you look at um, the, the factors that influence the, the microbial communities, this is just a PCA plot, then you, you ask yourself, what are the factors that influence the separation of those microbial communities? Uh, the most important one is porosity. And I've underlined that just because porosity is sort of, sort of geophysically non-specific, if you like. I mean, the, the way in which the porosity will change in a rock will depend upon the rock type, but it, it's a sort of universal effect of impacts to shatter rocks just because of the blunt delivery of energy into geological substrates. And this has relevance to the topic of this seminar, which is what effect would impacts have on the habitability of the marshes deep subsurface? Of course, depending on where you are, in this case, Chicxulub, uh, we've got the influences of total organic carbon temperature, iron, magnesium, sulfur. So clearly the chemistry of the impact site will influence the microbial community. But porosity, this, this universal effect of impacts, is one of the factors that determines uh, how these communities are separated within, within the rocks. And just to point out that we saw similar things in Chesapeake um, impact crater. Um, this is just off the coast of, of um, Chesapeake Bay. Uh, this was about seven or eight years before. We were much more limited in our ability to extract um, DNA from this crater. And I'm not going to spend much time on this because Chicxulub was, was the main point. But just to show you, we see, saw exactly the same thing. Um, at the bottom of the crater, this is impact breccia, sway bite there, and heavily fractured schist and pegmatite. You can see this increase in microbial numbers again. And in the Chesapeake, we also saw um, increases in concentrated Fe2 plus produced iron. And we attribute that to iron reducing bacteria because we did manage to extract functional genes associated with Geobacter, which are iron reducing microorganisms. So it seems there's a population of iron reducers living in this uh, more fractured material. You see the porosity has increased uh, in this sway bite compared to uh, some of the background. So, this is another example of an impact influence um, habitat. So, going back to this, we're thinking about Mars, as the subject of my seminar. What, what might all this tell us about um, the habitability of the subsurface of Mars? Well, the face of it, you might predict that impacts would fracture the deep subsurface, potentially enhance the flow of nutrients or other key biological plants into the subsurface and improve the habitability of the Martian subsurface. Uh, so that's just a hypothesis. And I guess the way to test that would be to go and drill on Mars into impact craters and look at the history of fluid flow through the branches. So that's what I would do. I'd send a human mission to Mars and drill into a crater and try and understand the habitability. So that seems like um, you know, that seems like a positive effect of impact. But Mars has other interesting historical factors to consider other than uh, a large number of impact craters on the surface. And one of those interesting, oh yeah, so this is, this is uh, just stuff that's in, uh, yeah, so this is some work that we're just finishing off with, um, uh, with, with um, some folks in Edinburgh, where we use a model to, to calculate, so this is rather a crude estimation, if you think about the energies, all those impacts, different sizes, and you think about the transmission of the shock wave, you can crudely calculate the fracture space caused by all of those impacts on Mars and work out the total fracture space. And if you express that fracture space as the number of Mars radius spheres, so if you think about Mars as a billiard ball, this flat surface of the planet, how many equivalent Mars spheres would fit into all of those fracture spaces, subsurface of Mars? And you end up with something like uh, 3 million to 200 million Mars radius spheres uh, equivalents of impact fracture space. And you can see this is a very, very hand waving because some of these fractures might be occluded. Uh, we don't really understand propagation of shock waves through the salt, even on uh, laboratory samples on the earth. So it's very crude. But anyway, the, the qualitative point is, and I should say this thickness is, is uh, completely arbitrary, just to illustrate this uh, angular fraction rock that you might call impact sphere. So contiguous contiguous fractured rock on Mars. But anyway, the point is it's huge, potentially huge habitat. Uh, that's not to say there isn't porosity by mechanisms other than impact, but the point is if you work out the, the impact induced fracture space, it might be a way it's fast. But there are there are other interesting things about the surface of Mars uh, and its history that one might consider uh, from a microbiological point of view. 
We know, as I said earlier in the talk, that Mars had plenty of liquid water um, in its early history. Uh, but that liquid water um, eventually dissipated. It froze into the ground and the atmosphere thinned and it evaporated. And we have a desert world we know today. And this happened uh, about between about three and a half, three billion years ago during the Hesperian. Uh, although some people think that even today there might be subsurface briny fluids flowing out of the subsurface. It's controversial images of what some people claim as um, uh, seasonally melted briny fluids coming out of the subsurface of Mars. But anyway, the point is that the liquid water has dissipated. And when, and when the bulk of the water disappeared, we know that the surface of Mars became covered in the various concentrated brines as that water was concentrated. So that impact fracture network might well improve habitability, but one can also hypothesize that it might allow briny fluids to penetrate more easily into the deep subsurface. And one of the ways in which you can look at the effects of brines on subsurface microbiology is to go to briny environments. And this is just some work I'm going to put into this talk, uh, done by one of my PhD students, uh, Sam Payler. In the Zepstein Sea, at the edge of what is now the east coast of the UK, this was a giant inland sea formed in the Permian. Think of this as like a, a vast um, deep fracture full of briny fluids. And at the bottom of Bulby Mine, which is today an active mine mining this salt, you have kilometer thick sequences of uh, of calcium sulfate and hydrite and gypsum, uh, also some, um, some phosphate salts. It's mined today for fertilizer. But of course, it's often an opportunity to go a kilometer on the ground and look at the effects of these brines on microbiology. So we went down to the Bulby mine and we collected uh, DNA from different sites in the mine and we analyzed what was in there. This is a whole other story to talk about what grows in Bulby mine. But for the point of this seminar, I just want to focus on, on one uh, message from this that I think is relevant to this Martian disanalogy. These are some different brides from, um, from Bulby. This is chemical data. Don't worry about looking at all this in detail. Just want to focus on one thing, which is that one of these brides has a water activity of 0.566. Now, water activity, AW, is a measure of the availability of water. So, water activity of one is distilled water. Water activity of zero is basically complete desiccation. And once you get to a water activity of below about 0.57, uh, there's no known life that can inhabit these sorts of fluids. And the reason why this particular brine, if you compare it to the other one, has a low water activity is because it's got high concentrations of magnesium and chloride. So magnesium chloride tends to depress the water activity uh, to below that required for life. So this is an example of a brine uh, fluid that has been produced where if you get the right combination of ions, you end up with uninhabitable uh, fluids, aqueous environments. Everyone says follow the water. It's sort of NASA mantra of follow the water. But you, you can easily make aqueous environments on the earth that are uninhabitable. And I should say even these brines are quite low water activity and the microbiology in there is rather limited compared to say a freshwater environment. Um, you can attempt to get things to grow in this brine. This is just a table showing you all sorts of different communities from Bulby that contain microbes, and you can put it in 101p and nothing grows. And that doesn't, that doesn't definitively demonstrate this, uh, this brine is uninhabitable because maybe there's a microbe out there we haven't tested that would grow in there. But it is good evidence that it's consistent with the expectations of the water activity that this is uninhabitable. This is another brine where you can cross inoculate and demonstrate microbes moving back and forth between different brines and being able to um, colonize these kind of brines. So here's an example of, um, of an uninhabitable solution. The focus in this, in this work was to demonstrate an ionic limit to life in the deep subsurface. And what we were trying to show is that although the geothermal gradient often limits the microbial deep biosphere, in some places on the earth, uh, different different ionic combinations can also limit uh, the deep subsurface biosphere. And about 20 percent, I think, of the terrestrial subsurface is underlain by evaporites. So ionic constraints on deep subsurface life uh, may even be important on the earth. So here's an example of, of briny fluids that have rendered the subsurface uninhabitable with respect to life. And just to tie this back into um, the focus for today, although I said that the uh, all of these impacts will increase the fracture space in the subsurface of Mars. We might also note that 
given the history of Mars, here's another disanalogy with the Earth. Perhaps during this period, when all those brines were being formed, the impact fracturing may have even facilitated the movement of deleterious brines into the subsurface and limited life. So you could argue the impact events overall the deleterious because they allow the movement of brines that are on the Earth are localized or sometimes localized to the surface. But this, this extensive fraction network would allow those brines to uh, penetrate into the into the subsurface. And again, this is a this is a testable hypothesis. The way you would do it is just go and drill on Mars and see whether in fact uh, the impact fracture networks improved or um, or, or, or reduce the potential for habitability. Um, if you look at the surface of Mars today, this is uh, about 30 centimeters across. It's an image by Curiosity, and you can see these calcium sulfate veins on Mars. Where I don't know whether you, I don't think people know whether these are fracture networks, but anyway, they are a um, a series of fractures on the surface, and a lot of these fractures are filled with these. Um, these sorts of calcium sulfate in this case, but they're sort of quite pervasive on Mars. If you look at images taken by the rovers, you'll see endless images of these uh, salt filled fracture networks, supposedly from groundwater that welled up when Mars was drying up and sort of filled these fractures with salts and, and it created these conditions. And so, in some sense, on the surface, there's already some sort of empirical evidence that a lot of these fracture networks might have been filled with, with briny fluids. And these, in this case, this is calcium sulfate, which is not uh, uninhabitable. But anyway, I think what we want, what we want to do is to drill. And the point about um, this, what I'm trying to get across to you, is that you can't really just take an, an analog environment on the Earth and say, this is what happens with the microbiology, so this is going to be the same on, on Mars. You have to think about the long-term geology and geophysics, which ultimately changes the environment for biology. And as I said, although Mars is a strangely similar planet, there's clearly very different things going on there. Uh, lots of impact fracturing, uh, potentially periods of, of, of concentrated brines, all of which may lead to a subsurface that's very different from the one we, we know on the Earth. But we can certainly use microbiology to understand um, what might be going on um, in, in that environment. So that's, um, that, that's the effects of some of these brines. What I thought I'd do uh, finally is just to talk about some work that we've done recently, trying to understand the biochemistry of, uh, of brides on life. My undergraduate degree was actually in biochemistry, so it's quite nice to go back to what you were probably trained in. <laughs> and so I had a, uh, a student, um, Stuart Gould, who's in my lab, and we've been looking at the effects of perchlorate ions on, uh, on folding of biomolecules, things like proteins and DNA and membranes. And this is a collaboration with Roman Winter at the University of Dortmund. Perchlorates are interesting, um, these molecules here, oxidized. They're pervasive on Mars. They were discovered by the Phoenix um, lander, and they are in a concentration of about 0.4-0.6% ubiquitously in the Martian soil. But some people have proposed that there are higher concentrations. This is some, I think, controversial data, very controversial. Um, where these authors claim that they could see radar reflections of uh, briny lakes under the South Pole of Mars. So here's the South Pole of Mars. You're looking at a cross section through this area. These nice um, regular lines here are the layers of, of ice, South Pole. Um, you know, just as an aside, look at that, absolutely fantastic. If you want a climate history of Mars, go and drill through that and get a call from the climatologists amongst you. But anyway, these bright reflectors down here were proposed to be liquid water. And at the temperature these things are supposed to be at, which is, you know, on the order of, um, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, minus 55, minus 60, I think, in this paper. But anyway, you can't get brines at these low polar temperatures on Mars without something that depresses the freezing point to many tens of degrees Celsius. And in fact, the only way you can really do that is concentrated perchlorate ions in this water to allow for the liquid water. So these remain controversial. I'm not sure whether people really believe it, but anyway, um, from the point of view of understanding this planet and its habitability, you can see that perchlorates have now sort of become pervasively connected with our attempts to understand uh, what's going on on that planet and how it may have influenced conditions for biology and goodness over there. So we did some uh, experiments to look at the effects of perchlorates on uh, chymotrypsin. Chymotrypsin is an enzyme that is um, 
that is involved in breaking down proteins. You can think of it as a sort of recycling enzyme that breaks down old proteins and breaks into their amino acids or peptide chains and allows them to recycle. The only reason why we use this is because it's like a, um, a lab rat in the enzymology world. So it's how you could describe it. Uh, everywhere. There's a lot of papers on this. We know how it works. The structures, of course, defined a lot of time ago, but also there's a lot of literature. Anyway, if you take chymotrypsin and you expose it to uh, magnesium chloride, so these are magnesium chloride solutions, you will see that the, um, the kinetic rate of the enzyme's ability to turn over its substrate, this is the substrate it's using, um, and I uh, have to confess I've completely forgotten the acronym. Anyway, that's what you give to it to, uh, to do the reaction. And you'll see that as you add the chloride, the the, um, the, the activity of the enzyme is decreased. And that's not very scientifically surprising. Uh, the chlorates are chaotropic molecules, they disorder molecules, they unravel molecules compared to cosmotropes, which tend to order things. So uh, a chlorate is it, called, it's, it's a chaotropic substance and it disorders. So what's going on here is as you increase the concentration, the, um, the enzyme is being unfolded and it's losing its activity. And if you look at this um, in a temperature pressure space, so our interest is in pressure, and this connects it with the deep subsurface. And we were asking the question if you go down to the subsurface of the planet and you've got perchlorate, you increase the pressure, and let's say you change the temperature in some undefined way, what happens to the temperature pressure space of the perchlorate interaction with climate trips? This is where Roland Winter with his apparatus came in, and we were looking at. Um, the difference between the unfolded, so that's the inactive enzyme, compared to the folded state, which is where it's all nicely folded up and is doing biochemistry. And you will notice as you add magnesium chloride, okay, 0.25 and 0.5, so that's 0.25 and 0.5, the pressure and temperature space becomes more restricted. The limits of enzymatic activity become more restricted, both in pressure and in temperature. And again, this isn't scientifically very interesting, it simply shows you that the unfolding effects of perchlorate happen at high pressures as well as uh, ambient atmospheric pressures. What's interesting is what happens in here, where you've got a folded molecule, but you start to increase um, magnesium perchlorate in small amounts at high pressures. So in here, you've got the effects of uh, perchlorate and pressure of where it's folded. And what we found, which is quite interesting, was that when you add um, 0.25 molar magnesium perchlorate at 2000 bar, the K cap, sort of the efficiency of the enzyme, efficiency of the turnover, is actually increased compared to the control buffer. Okay. So the perchlorate is actually improving catalytic efficiency um, at, at high pressures. Um, as you can see here, this is the this is the control at one bar, and this is um, the catalytic efficiency at 2,000 increasing. So what's going on here? It's difficult to know exactly, but one hypothesis might be that as you pressurize it, you'll, you can think of it sort of slightly squishing the, the protein. When you add the chlorate, you're causing some unfolding, but what it's actually doing is it's unfolding it just enough to make the active site available to the substrate without completely unfolding the protein. So in some sense, it's like counteracting the effects of the pressure, at least in the active site, and is improving catalytic efficiency at uh, under high pressure conditions. So it's an interesting example of how you can end up with counterintuitive results when you start to look at pressure effects. This is often true in microbiology when you start putting things together, um, stresses together in the same place. You, are, you can sometimes see synergies between stresses which are different from stresses on their own. And in fact, there's a sort of lamentable lack of microbiology experiments where people tend to look at interaction between different extremes. So with respect to the to the emulsion story, which is what I wanted to focus on um, today, one might simply observe that again, things are not so simple. So yeah, impact fracturing fractures the surface, makes it better, but no, we might get brines in there that are deleterious, but then we can flip that round and also observe that certain brines on Mars that are rare on the Earth, like the chlorates, in the deep subsurface under high pressure, might even have some beneficial effect for biochemistry. And of course, it goes without saying we don't know whether there was any life on Mars, but the point about studying habitability is to try and understand the theoretical constraints on biology in different planetary environments, regardless of whether there was life there to take advantage of it or, or not. So 
So I think it's a very interesting environment, and we don't know a lot about the Martian south surface. In fact, we really don't know anything apart from places in fact where impact craters have exposed some of the deep subsurface Noachian terrains. But there are clearly interesting habitability questions to be asked by uh, drilling into the subsurface of Mars, looking at the salts and the impact fractures, uh, understanding what those salts might do to biochemistry and microbiology. You could imagine in some future time you have a Martian drill in the core. You get the core, you look at the fractures, you look at the salts in there, and you carry out microbiology experiments to understand um, what those conditions might have meant uh, for life if it had ever been known. Even if it hadn't, you could begin to understand uh, whether Mars was habitable. If there was no life, well, why not? If, if there were habitable conditions, why was there no life taken advantage of them? Um, so, um, to be time, I'm going to um, just conclude the scientific part, and then I'm going to take five more minutes of your time and then stop. Uh, so I won't read this out verbatim, but simply if you want to look at it later, I, my punchline for this seminar is that Mars is a very different world to the Earth, and you can easily look at basaltic rocks, impact craters, and you can just draw parallels. But actually, you really have to think about the history of this world and what's happened. And it, it is an alien world in the sense we've got pervasive impact fracturing, if you don't see on present day Earth, at least maybe earlier, but not present day Earth. We've got an interesting history of brines. We've got alien brines. We don't see so much on the Earth. I mean, there are perchlorates in places like the Atacama. It's not like they don't exist on the Earth, but there we have brines that are pervasive on Mars, but it's on the Earth. And to truly understand habitability, you, you actually have to sort of cobble together data from different places on the Earth to try and piece together a sort of jigsaw of what might be going on and carry out lab experiments. And ultimately, the way to avoid jigsaw is to go to Mars and drill and get some proper samples and do some proper science. So it's sort of a very facile conclusion that you should go and drill on Mars. But, but, but understanding habitability in centers like this can help us um, construct hypotheses that we can test. So it's a rather um, sort of, uh, uh, what should I say, sort of facile summary of what we want to do. So that's the end of uh, the science part. I, I realize I said 45 minutes. Let me just take five more minutes of your time. And as they say in Monty Python, and now for something completely different, this is a center for habitability. So I thought I'd spend five minutes just telling you about uh, an education project that we've run out of our center, which I think is a, a nice illustration of the way habitability in astrobiology can be used for impact type of work. Um, so this is a bit different, but. Um, if you'll just bear with me, I'm just going to I'm just going to talk about this for a few more minutes. It may interest some of you if you're interested in outreach, uh, public connections with that with uh, astrobiology and habitability. This is the Mars station, and if you look at it carefully, it bears similarities to prisons. Okay, I did say this is going to be completely different. Mars is still surface. Uh, a prison is a sort of confined environment where you've got a population of people who form their own society, very sort of strong social uh, bonds that are disconnected from the mainstream of society. It's semi-self-sufficient, and all of these people have a very, a very uh, strong experience of confinement in, in what one might consider to be um, some sort of extreme environment. Of course, this is not as extreme as this, but in a simplified way, you could think of prisons as the largest analog program on the earth for understanding <laughs> human adaptation to space. So I thought a few years ago, maybe these people know something about this, the rest of us don't, and they might have some good ideas. So I went to the Scottish Prison Service, and I set up a, a program called Life Beyond. We've now been running for six years. And it's to get prisoners to design stations for, uh, for the moon and Mars and beyond. So it's a course that we run for about 25 participants at a time, runs over about three months, it's four phases. The first phase is the scientific phase where they learn about conditions on Mars. So some of the things I've been talking to you about today, I might give this sort of similar lecture, maybe at a slightly uh, simpler level to, to the prisoners, to get them to understand the science of Mars and what goes on there. But then they use that knowledge to design their own station um, involving creativity and science. And then they think about what they would do on the moon and Mars. Once they get there and build their station, what are they actually going to do in terms of science? And then finally, in the part, last phase, they think about building a society on Mars. What happens if someone breaks the law? And how do you construct the justice system on Mars? And this is a way for them to think about why they've ended up in prison and why you know, the police service and the justice system might not be as bad as they think it is, because you sort of need that to hold the society together. So this is a way of getting them just to think about their own situation. And this has been a, a really fantastic experience. I have to say, it's been one of the most fulfilling 
teaching experiences that I've ever been involved with. This is as an example of Elysium Station. This was designed by some prisoners in Glenorchal High Security Prison. Of course, before they go to prison, they have expertise. Some of them are artists, it's this beautiful watercolor. Some of them are engineers, so they've gone ahead and designed the whole structure of the station. So this isn't just science and technical expertise, they can do all sorts of things related to uh, art and creative writing. So this group of prisoners then went and designed a 200 year timeline for stations on Mars. You can see the Lysium stations in here. So it's become a tiny station in a giant tourist station. This is a poster they painted inviting you to come and play golf on Mars. I look for fossil fish, I think it's a bit optimistic, but <laughs> there you are. And they wrote a 200 year timeline. Uh, so we had a couple of people who really liked writing, and they wrote this 200-year timeline of all the political events on the Earth and Mars that had occurred uh, in that time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a lunar project. They designed a strategy for a long-term uh, lunar settlement. And then just before I uh, get some of their uh, fantastic artwork, just before I came up here, we, we finished um, our, our most recent project, which was to get them to design uh, an interstellar ship to Proxima Centauri B. So this is a ship traveling at 10th light speed, so it takes 40 years. And they would be the vanguard of establishing a scientific station on Proxima Centauri B, one of our nearest exoplanets. And every five years, a scientific crew would go out there and essentially commit their life to science on Proxima Centauri B. So this is some of their designs we're about to um, publish. What do we do with all of this? Well, we turn it into books, and this is a collaboration with the British Planetary Society. Uh, these are the, the books that they publish. These books we send out to space agencies and other institutions, and they also go to the parole files of the prison. So when they come out in front of their parole committee to be considered for liberation, they can say, well, you know, I know I did something bad, but I, I developed a strategy for the long-term settlement in Mars. I was in prison, here's my book. And you have to realize that many of these people come from uh, broken families and they have very bad experiences in education. But for them to learn about space exploration that they don't know anything about beforehand, and within a few months, end up publishing a book. Uh, I know it's a much overused word these days, but it, but it is transformative because it completely changes their view and makes them realize that education can actually be fun and you can do crazy creative things with a, with a minimum amount of knowledge. And this is something that I think all of us will relate to. We're not often encouraged to think like this in high school, <laughs> at least the school I went to. You know, we never did anything like this. Um, but, you know, it, this is where education can lead do it in the right way, I think, or at least, you know, you, you allow people their creative expressions. So this is what this has been um, about. It's been hugely productive. Recent, well, in the pandemic, when we couldn't get into prison, we thought, can we turn this whole course into a distance learning course that doesn't require us physically going to prisons? We couldn't get in there. So we took all of our materials and we built these, um, these units that were sent out by PDF, and there are short activities that take a day in the prisoner can open this and it gives them some background, they don't need any education from anyone else, and within a day they can be designing a lunar sport or contributing to a lunar Martian cookbook, uh, writing a letter home from Mars, planning a Martian government, planning a Martian adventure, and so on. And so this is now being done by uh, a few prisons in, in England. Uh, we've got a connection recently with the Lithuanian prison service, interesting, because that, that prison system has the, the relics of the Soviet prison system still lurking there, which uh, is not very good to say the least. So these sorts of things might be uh, useful in Eastern Europe, but we're still struggling with the legacy of sort of brutalized prison system. Yeah. Um, so that's um, just an education project to give you some idea about a link between habitability, which is what it is, so thinking about conditions on Mars and how we can um, uh, plan for future uh, expertise elsewhere, and having to bring in disenfranchised and, and minority populations, particularly the prison populations, particularly disenfranchised with respect to education, with very few opportunities, and get them involved in thinking about habitability, life beyond the uh, uh, opportunities. So I'd just like to uh, finish there, just thank my, some of the people who funded us, and our, our, our happy uh, Christmas party astrology group. Uh, Edinburgh, thank you very much for your for your time, and I'll be around for the next week. Happy to meet anyone who wants to talk anything astrobiology, prison, anything else. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's great. Why don't we take uh, questions in the room? And anybody online, uh, just drop them into the chat, and I'll read them out to Charles. So, questions.
Great. Yeah, I want to understand your basic onslaughts, that wonderful map, the impact you show yeah. and how large it's so different. I, are, are, is it a fact or are you saying that Mars is different because it's in a different part of the solar system? And how do you how do I think about that compared to Earth, which erodes the impact? Yeah, well, surely there's more than 197 impact right. on the Earth. So, so I just want to understand that yes. basic onslaught. Yeah. That, that's a really good point. So Mar Mars never had plate tectonics, although there's some sort of evidence that sort of may have tried to get going very, very early on, but it certainly didn't continue. And so these early impacts, maybe these impacts more than three billion years old, are in uh, are on a planetary surface that's been largely unaltered for the last three billion years. And of course, there's no strong hydrological regime on the surface to erode craters. Uh, the atmosphere is a, is a hundred the density of the Earth. All these factors come together. I mean that there are a very large number of relatively uh, well-preserved craters, whereas on the Earth, of course, over the last uh, four billion years, all those uh, most of those ancient craters have been subducted and destroyed. There are a few craters very rare. But if Earth had all those craters, even if they got eroded away, doesn't that anneal some of the difference between Mars and the Earth? Um, so, so the impact flux has dropped over time, of course. So, so you had early plate tectonics that have raised that, that high impact flux in the early history of the Earth. And then in, in recent years, you know, when I say recent years, tens of hundreds of millions of years, very much, very much fewer impacts. And so you end up with just fewer impacts on the Earth's land masses. That makes sense. And I should, and just, just to address the other point you made, 197, of course, isn't all of them, and they continue to be discovered every year there are new papers before finding impacts and now people are using radar find impacts under the, the Greenland ice shelf or the, or the Antarctic ice shelf so there's certainly there are surely more than 200 but of course we haven't got this um, unaltered surface over four and a half billion years to to retain all those impacts and particularly the uh, impacts during that higher period of the period of higher impact flux in the early history of the solar system thank you yeah, would it be fair to say that there are a few places on Earth, like the Canadian Shield, where only the surface has been altered and where the deep, deeper part of the planet that's analogous to what you're investigating here has to be affected by plate tectonics? Yes. Um, are there analogies there that are worth exploring? Then there may be. Um, there's there's pre Cambrian basement rock up in the Canadian high Arctic and, and actually in northern Scotland as well. Uh, and in Greenland, but these some of these rocks are well, Greenland rocks, issue of rocks going back 3.8 billion years, a bit heavily uh, metamorphosed. Um, so I mean, there are there are there are, there are there's pre Cambrian evidence for tectite fields, Archean tectite fields. This is getting again slightly outside my area, maybe others have. But if you, there are analogies, you can look and see, you can look for evidence of impacts in the Precambrian, these tectite fields, these small spherules of glass that seem to be evidence of larger impacts in the Archean, people claim to have found in the rock record. It's just that there's not much Cambrian, Precambrian rock on the Earth. I'm not sure what percentage of the Earth's terrestrial land mass is Precambrian. I would guess like 5% or something, I might be wrong, but I don't know why I come up with that number, it's sort of vaguely and maybe that might be. So there are analogies, but of course you just don't have. So, so not only have you got the ancient, um, uh, the ancient landscape preserved on Mars, but of course it hasn't been heated and tectonized and metamorphosed. And even some of the best Precambrian rocks on the Earth have been pressurized and, and heated, so they're not in particularly good shape. So you, you certainly don't have large scale um, uh, impact craters with, with the number you find on Mars. The Sudbury impact crater in Canada, that's 2.4 billion years old, I think. So there are pre Cambrian craters on the Earth. They're just not that many. We've read of what I think is 1.2. Yeah, uh, in South Africa, that's a large crater, uh, 1.2 billion years old, but they're just very few and far between. 2.1. 2.1. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Got it. I have two questions. First of all, I really love your outreach program, and I was wondering if you're sharing these PDFs. Yeah, like if that's possible. Yes, I'm it just is. Really curious to to see that and see the exercises. Yeah. And the second one is obviously a very like 
a little long question, but I'm just curious if you actually looked at different uh, habitats in the solar system, what your personal opinion is that it's most likely that you will ever detect life. <laughs> so, yeah, first question on, on prison stuff, sure, I'm yeah. very happy to share it. And if you want any collaboration, really keen to help expand this program as well. It's it's not easy getting into prisons. So when we came up with these, well, when we did this Scottish Prison Service to begin with, and when, when I first went to them six years ago, I thought everyone would throw up their arms to go, oh, you know, academics from university offering some education, yeah, we'll take that. But actually, it's really difficult. And I think that's depressing in some ways. It's Prisons have certain types of education they deliver, mainly it's vocational, so woodwork, metalwork. And uh, in a lot of prisons, the attitude is, you know, what do these academics think they're doing? Um, you know, moseying around here trying to offer education programs. We were lucky because the head of education in the Scottish Prison Service was a sort of visionary person. He sadly is now left. And he wanted to expand education to beyond vocational material to trying to get prisoners to sort of develop self-respect, regardless of how that's delivered in education. And so what I was trying to do was convince them that exploring Mars is actually something they understand that we don't. Okay, so here's something that prisoners can do better than the rest of us. So rather than just think, how can we punish these people or put them on the right track as we tend to think about the justice system? How can we find something that they can take pride in that the rest of us do not have a grasp of? In long-term confinement, something they fully understand. So that was the motivation. The Scottish Prison Service got that and got really enthusiastic. But it's not easy to go into other prison systems and do the same. Even in England, it's been more difficult. I don't know about the US prison system, the penitentiary system, or the Texan system. Yeah. It would be interesting to, to try it and see what happens. Uh, often also it can be specific to particular prisons. Like <laughs> if you find the right prison governor who runs a particular prison, that can make it easy, even if the overall system is not uh, helpful. And anyway, so, so, so I would be very sure I can give you the PDF so if you're interested in discussing it more. Yeah, I would love to read it and just yeah. I can the exercise of myself, but I don't know why I'm not in prison, but I'm just, I'm just very curious. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then where will we find life? I have no idea. <laughs> um, you know, is there life elsewhere, at least in our solar system? Mars is a strange place. Depending on the on the time of day and, and how I feel that day, I go from optimism to extreme pessimism. So I look at all those rocks in water, I showed you some of those sediments. I think how could it possibly how could you possibly have a whole planet? That's completely sterile when you look at the numbers of organisms on the earth. And then I see other pictures of broken up pieces of basalt taken by rovers, and they're sort of shiny, iridescent, blue and green in the middle, like they've never really been weathered or altered. Uh, and if there were lots of microbes around, they would have got in there and it wouldn't be nice and shiny and iridescent. They would be oxidizing that eye. I look at it and think, you know, it just looks so dead to me. So I don't know. I have no idea. Icy moons. Um, are interesting targets like Enceladus, but can you get an origin of life in an icy moon? Could there have ever been um, transfer of life? I wouldn't be surprised, and this is just again wild speculation, if we were to find uh, a lot of worlds out there that are habitable, in theory have all the conditions for life, but are lifeless, sort of uninhabited, 